again to Vancouver and uh, to listen to him speak about uh, some very interesting topics. Uh, I've uh, met Michael uh, a couple of years ago the first time and uh, he's been one of my favorite authors. So it's a real treat for me to be here and uh, be part of this conference every year. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get us involved this year as last year's, uh, couple, last couple of years. Uh, this time it's a really uh, special occasion for me to introduce Michael because it's touching on things that are very dear to me, and that's uh, portion control systems. Um, uh, he's been an influence in my career for quite a while, uh, starting with the book on working effectively with legacy code, which has been a uh, very important piece of work for me and uh, wherever I, I, I go in my career. So uh, please make uh, Michael feel welcome to Vancouver. Is this? Yeah, that's a good volume, right? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so, yeah, nice to be here again and talk to you about things I'm interested in and hopefully you're interested in it too. Otherwise, if you're not, let me know. I'll just take off, I guess, right? <laughs> so, one of the things I've been doing recently is basically digging into version control systems and trying to learn a bit more about how they can teach us about how we develop software. Um, just a uh, preamble to that. Um, recently, I had I was with went to Optiva as the group was being acquired by Groupon. So I'm at Groupon right now, so that's okay. Um, okay. Can I start over? Okay. Uh, there's something that has been kind of striking to me over the last ten years or so. And that's that we don't really there's a lot of things that we think we know about software design, but the question is really whether we really do, whether these things that we know really are true. Okay? How, many, how many people here have heard of like the, um, the solid principles, like open closed principles, and responsibility? Okay, these are just kind of like baked into the fabric of object orientation. They're very important you know, ways of understanding how software design works. And it's very interesting about them because um, where's the evidence? Right? It's like uh, the single responsibility principle. It's one of those things. It's almost like it feels like it's it feels like it's just an obvious thing, right? But essentially, if you have some class or say some method and it has more than one commingled responsibility, we can get into a little bit of trouble, right? And so some people have kind of noticed this. You know, Bob Martin noticed this. Other people in the industry and they sort of came up with these formulations, these principles that help us guide help guide us in design. The thing that's really kind of funny about this to me is that it seems that we're really in a position these days to go and sort of find out um, how accurate these things are. And basically go ahead and sort of do some empirical work to go and understand uh, you know, what can we really you know, learn from our existing code bases. So it comes down to me to this fundamental question, how much do we really know about how we develop software? And uh, there's always like this thing of appearances and reality that I kind of like to discuss a bit. Okay? Anybody ever see a diagram like this at all? Boxes and lines. Anybody create diagrams like this at all? Occasionally, not as many people, right? It's like, now that we've gone agile, everybody's kind of like, oh, we're going to merge the design over time, change things and keep in place and tidy and stuff like this. But in the old days, quite often, people would go and diagram at classes and go and have these, these quite, um, quite clean pictures of what they were targeting when they were going and developing things. And of course, the alternative, though, really is the view that we have of our systems in actuality quite often. If you ask the average developer what their system is like, is it good and clean and tidy? Quite often they're like, oh no, it's a big ball of mud. Right? It's basically got all sorts of horrible things inside of it. And I know where all those horrible things are, and yes, it works, but we could make it better. Right? It's kind of hard to go and sort of square these two visions of systems, the clean and tidy, and then what we know we actually have. And what's funny about this to me is that it seems like we kind of end up here um, way more often than we expect it. Right? Is that fair? We end up there. No one's going to argue with me, okay? Right. Okay, yeah, well, quite often we end up with kind of odd systems that just aren't all that easy to understand or maintain. Why does that happen? Must be a reason. It's because we're lazy, right? Because we're bad developers. We aren't following our design principles. We aren't moving forward and doing the things we need to do. Well, that's one way of looking at things. The other way of looking at things is that there's a reason why some of these things happen, right? And um, I like to sort of like look at it from this point of view. Which is really easier, adding code to an existing method or adding a new method to a class? 
Which is easier? The second? Okay, I don't know. That's interesting. What about this one right here? Which is easier, adding a method to an existing class or adding a new class? Yeah. What's funny about this, because I asked this question, right? I asked these two questions about our system design. And the thing that's kind of funny about this is I feel like I don't even have to ask these questions, right? If we basically look at our systems and look at the history of version control of our systems, we should be able to figure out which one really is easier, okay? This is really part of a view of um, uh, human behavior that's called uh, behavioral economics. I know how many people have, like read free economics or some of these other books that basically discuss um, this particular area of knowledge. And what it's about really is not really money so much, it's basically trying to understand how um, people make decisions in the face of incentives, right? And I'd argue that basically with these two questions that we have here, we don't even have to go and ask the question. We don't need to go and sort of guess at what the answer is. We can basically look back at the data and try to figure out what's going on with our systems and understand which one of these things is true. Okay? So, adding code to an existing method or adding a new method? What do you think? I'm going to go and bring it down to reality now. Has anybody ever had a long method in their code base? <laughs> right, we have really, really long methods occasionally, right? And I'd argue that those methods are really, really long because somehow people find it easier to add code to an existing method than they do adding new methods to a class. Right? And in much the same way, okay, adding method to an existing class is quite often easier than stepping off and creating a new class. Now, you know, that sort of thing we can kind of see that in our code base. We know we have this tendency to go and have very long methods over time and very big classes over time. And we know what the antidote is, right? We have to go and refactor in order to make things better, break things down to smaller pieces so they're a little more understandable and stuff along those lines. But yet we still have large classes and large methods. And that really gets down to the issue of like, okay, what, you know, what really causes that? Um, one theory that I have about this is that essentially the first one is quite often easier for developers here, adding code to an existing method. Because, in essence, you don't have to think about naming. Right? It's kind of like I have some big chunk of code, I'm going to add some code to it, and I don't have to really think about what my intention is for that little piece of code. I just inline it inside that method. Right? In the other case, you have to sit there and think, oh, okay, I've got this chunk of code. What am I going to call it? Right? And this may sound like a trivial thing, but frankly, good naming is very hard. And quite often, people don't want to expend the mental effort to go ahead and say, oh, well, I'm going to come up with a new name for this particular piece. It's just you know, a fact of human nature. And also, you can say there's a physical labor involved. Yeah, it's easier to go and put the code in the existing method because it's less typing. Okay? I think that's really negligible compared to the first thing. Same thing tends to be true for classes and uh, and adding methods to existing classes. The, the run-of-the-mill thing to do is basically go ahead and add methods to existing classes. And over a while, you know, they start to get larger and larger and larger. Maybe they can be separated out into different classes, but that requires a degree of effort that's beyond what people normally do in code base. Okay? Um, so we really shouldn't be surprised by what we see. Okay? It seems, in a sense, that basically code has a bit of a natural shape. Right? Um, there will be some very large methods in our code base and there will be some smaller ones. And um, we probably will always have that situation. Is that kind of nihilistic, I guess? We know we can make our code better, right? But seriously, how many people here feel like you've got a very, you do a very uh, diligent job of refactoring your code base? Yeah? Do you have any long methods? So-so, right? Now, it's, it's very funny about this, because the thing is I've encountered teams where they try to take a very hard line on this sort of thing. I remember going to one team and sort of being uh, a little bit stunned because they're sitting there and they were asking me to review their code and looking through things. And they had lots of nice methods, but it was kind of hard to understand each one in isolation. It's kind of like they had pretty decent naming and stuff like that, but then this would call another one and this would call another one. And it just felt artificial somehow. And I just basically happened to gaze across the wall and I saw the rules of the team. And one of them was basically no method should be longer than eight lines. That's kind of like a rule that they kind of pose on themselves. Sound like a great idea? It can be. The thing is, though, that I think that what happens with that is we're kind of going and we're moving against the natural uh, structure of what software can be and should be. Right? When you do that, people start going and saying, ah, my rule is eight lines. And they start to go and say, look, because of that rule, we go and do breakdown in a particular way. They do breakdown in a particular way, and it basically ends up going and suffering in terms of understanding things along those lines. Um, so generally, there really is this pattern to things. 
And one of the things that you'll notice, you know, if you basically look at like a histogram, frequency histogram of method sizes in any project, a good project or a bad project, you'll find that you have many, many, many small methods, and you basically end up having a few very large ones. And that's even in very good code bases. It just seems that there's this distribution that ends up happening. And you could argue, I guess, that good code bases and bad code bases differ in the coefficients of that distribution. Okay. Anybody know who this guy is at all? Steve Jobs. No. <laughs> but it's the Bertrand Meyer. Okay. Um, he basically articulated a lot of the early um, design principles that we've had in object orientation you know, for, uh, for ages now. Um, one that he is particularly famous for is the open close principle. Okay. Software entities should be open for extension of close for modification. Okay. Everybody's heard this one before? Is it true? <laughs> There's a funny thing about this. The way that he sort of articulated this at first was he was trying to go and find a good uh, set of rules for the use of inheritance, right? And this is back way back in the early object-oriented days. And everybody thought that inheritance was a panacea. You could basically use it to go and sort of extend your systems and stuff along those lines. And he kind of noticed that, well, you know, you should be able to write a class and write it in such a way that you can go ahead and subclass it and get another class that's going to go and have slight modifications, slight differences from the original one, and do your work in this new class. And what that means is you can have like this set of base classes that don't have to change all that much. And if they don't have to change all that much, that's really a standard of good design. You can end up having areas of code that don't really change. And um, we've kind of seen beyond that a bit now. Nobody uses inheritance as extensively as it was used early on in the industry. But the same type of thing tends to be true in essence, right? If we are to go and make things a bit more stable as we're developing software, we should hope that there are certain areas of code that we've you know, touched maybe five years ago, but we don't have to touch again, right? And that basically those things end up being close to change because we've basically found the right abstractions to do what we need to do. So we can actually check this out right, by going and looking back over our history. Okay, this is um, the code base for the closure programming language, written in Java. Okay, and basically the x-axis is all the files in the system. And they're basically sorted by the number of times they've had commits against them. It's kind of a curious shape, right? So if you look at everything that's off to the left here, okay, that basically is a set of files that have been committed to maybe once, twice, three times, four times, something like that. And there's a very small number of files that end up having you know, an extremely large number of commits. In a way, that kind of validates the open close principle. Right? It says that in this particular project, there are areas of code that don't change all that often. There's other areas that are just really high velocities for you know, high areas of change. What about those high areas of change, though? Well, we can look at those and say, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe those are just poorly designed or something along those lines. And um, it's worth it. Oh, look. We can basically look in those areas and figure out why are we committing these particular committing to these particular files over and over and over and over again. And, um, when you look at those things, you might establish that, well, maybe we've got too much code in this file that's tied with several different responsibilities. If we factored certain pieces out that are stable, we'd end up having you know, basically fewer commits against that file. And that's a way of going. Do you think we'll ever go and get rid of this shape, though? It's interesting. There are areas of code, every code base that I've seen so far, that change very frequently. And the thing that's kind of cool is if we recognize where those areas are, we can basically decide to refactor in those areas, or we can also go ahead and sort of, you know, uh, plan our development around those particular areas. So that's closure. This is the fitness code base. Okay, fitness is the, that, um, you know, tool for going and doing acceptance testing. Um, this is, again, a Java code base. And you'll see it's a bit, if I go back to the closure code base, different number of files here, but there are only a couple of files here that end up going and getting changed very, very frequently. But the same shape, right? And this is JUnit for comparison. Okay? Same type of thing. Some files get lots and lots of changes. Others are a bit more stable over time. So where do you want to refactor in your code base? It's kind of funny. I mean, the, the rule for refactoring quite often over time has been, okay, if you're about to make a change in an area of code, go in there and say, okay, well, is this really in the right structure that needs to be for me to go and do the refactoring I need to do, or do the, um, the change I need to do? and um, choose to refactor at that point if it isn't. So you refactor, basically make it a bit better for what it needs to be, make your change, maybe refactor a little more committed. Okay? 
And the thing about that is that you know, that actually works out pretty well with this sort of thing. If we do that you know, over time, we're going to end up hitting most of these things that are off to the right. Okay? Most of these areas are going to be touched and refactored over time. Now, on the other hand, though, it's really worthwhile when you're going and looking at doing some strategic refactoring in the code base to find out which areas are really being hit more often than other areas. Because that actually gets down to the ROI of refactoring. If you have some area of code that is terribly complex, and people touch it maybe once every year and a half, this is a great candidate for refactoring? I mean, it's probably worth doing, but the question is, are there areas of your code base where it's worth more to go and basically do those things? So, there's a lot you can tell by going and looking at these, you know, these trends within a code base. Here's a particular file in an unnamed application, and this is the uh, complexity of that file over time. Okay, and that's basically the sum of the complexity of all the methods and classes that have to be in that file. Um, good picture? Typical picture? <laughs> Can you see some refactoring? Sorry? I don't see the scale. Yeah, there's no real scale on it. The, um, this basically, I think, commits over time. Generally, with these things, I look at the shape, you know, and sort of determine trends, and the scale doesn't mean how that much. But um, yeah, here we can see some plateaus. There's certain times when basically there were a lot of commits that were made, you know, like in this area here. There were kind of uh, this period of time here, we didn't really have all that much happening to, in terms of increasing complexity. But there were some strategic, you know, removals of complexity at this point in time. They could have been deleting dead code. They could have been going and factoring things out to other areas. These types of pictures, I think, are rather interesting. This is um, file churn versus complexity in uh, code base in various code bases. So on the x-axis, what we have is basically the um, number of times the file has been uh, committed to. Okay? And on the, um, on the y-axis is the total complexity of the file. Okay? And this is complexity using a tool called Source Monitor. It's an open source tool that gives you a complexity metric for particular files on the code base. So what's this about? Is it good code base, bad code base? I don't think you can really tell you know, when you look at these things if it's a good code base or bad code base, but it is information you can basically use to go and help you move forward. Um, these areas over here, the upper right hand quadrant, is that a good area to be? Yeah, that's really high complexity, and it's code that changes all the time. Right? Typically, when I'm working in code base and I see this sort of thing, um, there's a pattern I kind of see happening over and over again. I call them like runaways. In that area of the picture, you essentially have things that are touched all the time. They keep increasing in complexity over time. And frequently, these are those rat's nest conditional methods, the ones where you have like lots of deep indentation and adding gifts in and stuff along those lines. In those cases, quite often what happens is that this is a particular area that nobody knows really how to refactor. They don't quite understand it, but they do know they can add a conditional to one basically achieve some effect and run some tests and sort of see that everything's kind of working. It's kind of working to commit and go on. But essentially, the trend for those things is to keep on moving off into the upper right-hand quadrant. Okay? What about things in the lower right-hand quadrant? It's not too much over here, but what would it mean if you had something that was like way, way down here? What would that mean? Lots and lots of commits, but it didn't really have much complexity. How could that happen? Version of Sorry? XML. XML, yeah. Essentially, XML and the ilk of XML is what I would say. Generally, these are areas where you have, you have code that's kind of like being treated like data in that sense. It's kind of like very few conditions. Um, you make little changes to it in order to go and tweak various things, and you just end up having those kind of outliers off to the side. Uh, this area over here, okay, the upper left hand quadrant, is an area I like to call cowboy territory. Okay, what that's about really is you have something which basically sprung forth from somebody's head very early on. Didn't take too many commits to go and get it going, uh, but it's very highly complex. Okay? And you know, it's, you can look at those things and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should go a little, a little deeper and figure out what's going on with them. It could also be things at the very beginning of their life cycle, so they're moving forward with things. But this is a little distressing that they started out out of the gate being that complex. Now what about the stuff down by the origin? That's nice, tasty, closed code. All right? This is code which basically was written, doesn't have too many commits against it, and the complexity is relatively low. Okay? 
The nice thing with this kind of diagram to do is basically draw a little path for each one of these files from the origin. You can see what the trend happens to be for a particular file. And based upon that, get a sense of, you know, what really needs help and what doesn't need help. Sorry. Um, so yeah, kind of nice picture going to sort of see what's happening in the code base. Let's take a look at another one. Okay, this is part of a tool that I worked on with um, Chad Fowler and Corey Haynes. We call it the <coughs> And in essence, the idea behind this was to be able to sort of take these diagrams and basically create them for any arbitrary Rails application, Ruby on Rails application. And you'll see the same type of patterns here, okay? Um, so I mentioned a little bit earlier, where's the scale, where's the scale? But generally with these things, um, I like to go and basically look at the pattern and sort of say, look, there's something over here which needs a bit more emphasis. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. The shape in general gives us some kind of sense of what things have been like in this code base. The thing that's particularly nice in this area here is that people didn't do an awful lot of high complexity out of the gate work at the very beginning. That's kind of useful to know about. Okay, this is basically the same diagram with only one particular category of classes within it. All the things that have to be in the models directory of the um, apps folder for that particular, uh, that particular uh, Rails application. Um, yeah, it's a very funny thing about Rails, because essentially Rails comes with like this baked-in uh, directory structure that you have, and you can actually go ahead and, through going and creating these kinds of diagrams, go and get a sense of, you know, where is the complexity in your system? Is it primarily in the controllers, primarily in the models, primarily in the helpers? You get a sense of how those trends have occurred over time in your code base. You can kind of handle it. Another thing I've been doing also is taking a look at method lifelines, okay? Um, for a particular code base, Taking a look and seeing how complexity has changed over time uh, for a particular method. Okay? So here's a method, started out, had very little complexity. Complexity jumps over time, big refactoring at some point in time, then reached a stable point. Okay? Here's a less exciting one. <laughs> Basically, took a couple of um, jumps up in complexity, ended up being stable, not much is happening to it. When you create these things for particular classes, you can get a really decent picture over time of what's happened to that class. Each one of these colored lines is basically a separate method in this particular class, and we can see how they've changed over time. So look like there's any evidence of refactoring in this class? Yeah, look for the dips down. Another thing you can look for, not just the dips down, but also look at the things that basically are added, or basically take a, a jump up at the same time that other things take a dip down. Right? It isn't conclusive evidence of refactoring, but it does show that there are particular episodes in here where some things basically took a hit down in complexity, other methods popped up at roughly the same time, and we can basically see it as evidence of refactoring. Core said it's going to cover everything. There are often cases where people go ahead and take big dips down in complexity, you know, in one area of the class and basically move all the complexity to another class. And it's kind of nice to don't see when those things happen also. You can tell when you look at a code base just how bad things are by how <laughs> How frequent the dip downs are. I mean, how infrequent the dip, dips down are. Sometimes you'll see code bases where there aren't very many dips down at all. And that's just basically indicating that people just really aren't doing all that much with regard to the So, funny thing I saw on the internet about six months ago, and um, I think it's kind of a worthwhile to, thing to mention. The, um, uh, there were some researchers in Israel, and they found out something very interesting about the way parole hearings. Um, achieve their outcomes, okay? And uh, the thing they discovered was that essentially it doesn't matter if you're a person going out for parole, uh, what your crime was, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, how long you're incarcerated, all these other things. It doesn't matter which judge you have. The thing which basically determined more than anything else, your chances of actually getting parole, were basically the time of day your hearing was set. Mm. Is that kind of fascinating? Yeah. Now this, this is kind of weird when you look at it. It's like this is what they, some of the data that they have, okay? Your chances of going and getting a favorable decision are very, very high the first thing in the morning. And then there's a dip down towards lunch. Lunch happens. <laughs> dip down towards the break in the middle of the day, then up higher. Oh, what the hell? Food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I, it, it shouldn't be that way, right? I mean, the, the prisoner has no control over the food. Right? <laughs> Bring a snack. Yeah, but the thing that they have as a hypothesis for this is that essentially 
there's mental fatigue that goes on. And basically, a judge-making decision, it's more conservative to actually go and say, look, I'm not granting parole if you feel that you're flagging in, in energy. You say it's Israel? Yeah. Well, clearly, who? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I don't know, there were Israeli researchers, I don't know whether they were re you know, researching outside of Israel or not. Um, but it's kind of fascinating. And the thing is, I bet you that the judges didn't recognize this happening at all, right? And what's kind of fascinating for us is, like, do we have other trends which happen for us as software developers that we aren't really aware of, right? That could we find out. We have emerging control history for our code bases, right? We can do some mining in order to sort of discover what happens over the course of the day in our, uh, in our development. So here's um, a couple of graphs. Here's commits uh, over the hours of the day. When I first one ran this, I got really shocked because I looked at this and I'm like, oh my god, these guys are just real monsters, right? It's like they, they work and they work and they work and they work and in the evening and then crash right before midnight. And then they sleep until one, one in the afternoon and they do this. It turns out this is an effect basically of um, uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Okay, actually it's uh, work is happening earlier in the day. <laughs> so, um, but you can see also there is like a lunchtime dip if you shift by, by five or six hours. Yeah. Things tend to sort of like go off and then like there's a ramp up towards the very end of the day and it goes and slaps down. Right? And so you can get a sense of what's going on with a particular team. One team I worked with and we did this sort of thing, the diagram was a bit off. There was like this strange ramp up at right about three o'clock and then it went down severely afterwards. And you know, it didn't take us too long to look around and realize what the issue was. The builds were taking so long that they would really want to commit. You know, after like three o'clock or so, because it just seems like, oh, it's kind of ridiculous. It's just not going to get results of that anytime soon. So you can see that sort of thing in the data when you're looking at things. Here's another one. Okay, you can see that there's not much similarity in shape. But the thing that's funny with this one is that this is a um, this is a team which is all localized in the same time zone, and it's a it's a work project. This one right here happens to be a project which is um, kind of like an after hours project that people have. And this is normalized for the time zone. That's just when they work. They tend to work ramping up to about 5 o'clock and you know, work all through the evening and kind of crash afterwards. What do you think that is? Open source. <laughs> <laughs> Open source, no. OK. What this is is basically the frequency of commits over the entire history of the code base by a second of the minute. It's amazing, isn't it? It looks like the 24th second of every minute is way more popular than the other ones. What did that mean? Yeah, exactly. That's the thing about this stuff. You have to basically be very careful about going and taking things which are essentially random and uh, imposing meaning on them. Okay? I don't think there's anything particularly special about uh, the 24th second of the minute. The thing is, I don't really have a statistics background, but I know the statisticians have a lot of methodology around trying to determine you know, what the accuracy of the sampling is and, and stuff along those lines. I think that this kind of work could really benefit from that sort of thing. This one's a little bit more interesting. This is commits per minute of each hour. Okay? And I tend to see a little bit of a pattern across different um, code bases in this. It seems like commits tend to happen a lot more at the 20 minute and the 40 minute mark of the hour. People tend to sort of like ramp up towards 20 and 40. It's not all that pronounced in here. You can see the ramp up at 40. Uh, the ramp up at 20 is yeah, kind of uh, minor in this particular case. But I think it just has to do with like meetings and scheduling and stuff on all those lines. This one is one I'm hoping to get more evidence to you know, sort of verify. I've seen it in a couple of different code bases. This is added complexity over time, okay, for the entire history of the code base. It's kind of hard to see with all these outliers here, but I guess if you kind of you know look a little closer, you can see that there's a lot more activity, a lot more height over here than there was in the very beginning. Okay? This is the amount of complexity added per commit over the history of the code base. Okay. So people are adding more complexity over time in the code base, naturally. But they're adding higher levels of complexity over time within the code base. And this could just be the general sign of wear within the code base. Kind of hard to tell at this particular point in time. This is complexity added by hour of the day. Okay. This particular code base. Very complex commits happening right after lunch in this particular team. What does that mean? I don't know. What's great in some cases, if you can, is to find somebody who can tie this up back to bugs. And um, if you do that, you might come get a better 
you know, understanding of exactly what, uh, uh, you know, what's beneficial and what isn't. Uh, there's an old story I remember hearing from a team that actually did this, and they started discovering that basically bugs were only added, well, not bugs were only added. Um, they had a higher chance of going and adding bugs into the code base after 4 p.m. each day. So they decided not to code after 4 p.m. and went off and did other things, and just generally this work and stuff like that. And, um, you know, this, basically this sort of thing is really available to you if you have someone going and correlating, um, you know, matching the data that you have from a bug system to the, uh, the repositories you have in your uh, system. So it's the same thing, but basically normalized by commits. This is amount of complexity added per commit, per hour of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, there's lots of other things you can look at. Number of files touched per commit. Okay. Um, the uh, scale there isn't all that great at the very <laughs> beginning. If you want to see actually the distinction there, but it turns out being a rather interesting indicator, a one-off indicator that tells you. Um, pretty much how people are handling uh, unit tests. Um, sometimes I'll see code bases where the number of files touched per commit hovers around one, the mode hovers around one for that, and um, that generally means that people are touching production code without them touching the corresponding tasks. If it hovers around two, you know, generally you're touching specs and touching production code. You see that things like that. Just to clarify, which is the y-axis and which is the x-axis? Okay, the, um, yeah, the number of files touched per commit is on the x-axis, and the y-axis is frequency. Okay, so basically there are over 600 cases in this code base where maybe about two or three files are touched. Okay. And the density one trail down past that. This one is one I've been playing with a bit recently, and uh, it ties in again to open post principle. Um, changes over time. I'm going to ask you to forgive the expression that's at the very top of that, even though it's kind of hard to read. The, um, I'm basically doing a lot of this analysis in Ruby on Ruby code. And um, what this is about is really going and saying, look, for our code base, um, what are the classes that are changed most frequently together in the same day by the same committer? Okay? So if I'm a committer and I'm working on the code base and I touch, you know, say, the app class, what other class am I likely to touch at the same time? Right? Um, and this is the frequencies associated with that. It turns out that there are, there are some classes which are just overwhelmingly all the time touched together in the code base. And you, it's worth looking at these things and going and asking yourself, look, for this particular code base, is there some kind of like a fault in our abstraction that these things are touched all the time together? Quite often from what we know about good design principles, you know, that often indicates we have some kind of a problem if we have to touch this every time we touch that. There are some very normal cases for this, too. And the normal case would be like, um, you know, if, you're model, if you're touching a controller, you're touching a view at the same time all the time. So right? it could mean that you know, that's just the way you separate concerns in that particular area. But if you have, say, two domain classes that are touched at the same time very frequently, you know, by the same player in the same day, it might be worth going and readdressing the abstractions you have in the code. So I'm going to basically go and sort of march through some analysis of a couple of different <coughs> testing, or a couple of different frameworks, that I've, not frameworks, but a couple of different applications I've had a chance to go and sort of dig into. Um, the first one is NK. It's a Rails blogging plat platform. And um, this is some of the stats related to it. There's like five unique committers for this particular uh, Rails project. Those are their names. And this number right here, 637 method events. Um, I have some software that I've written that I can give you a URL for later, that for an arbitrary Ruby project, what it does is it basically goes and parses all the source for every commit over the history of the repository. And what it does is it basically goes and creates an event, okay, this particular piece of data, a bundle of data, for every time that a method is added in the code base, every time a method is deleted in the code base, and every time a method is changed in the code base from its previous form, okay? And the changes are essentially white space invariant. And just Throw it with white space, and it's not going to be marked as a change. If you actually change the text of the method, it's going to go and give you a change event for that particular method. Um, so for this code base, basically there are 437 method events, and these are the spec to method ratios by committer. Okay, so we can get a sense of you know, who's really writing specs and who isn't in the code base. Right? Uh, looks like Javier. Okay, basically is not doing so well with that. Um, Jason isn't doing very well either. He has a very low spec to test rate, spec to total method ratio. Uh, Zach, uh, that's abysmal. What about Pedro? 
pretty good ratio, right? Except when you go and compare it against the number of method events that each one have tallied up themselves. Right? It looks like Pedro has only written one, or only made one commit in the code base, and that one had tests. So it basically bumped up his, um, his average rather high. But you know, it's, it's funny with this, you can go ahead and start to gather this kind of information. I mean, it can be a little bit useful. The thing that's important is not to be able to like a stick in a team and sort of like say, oh, you know, it's like you, you aren't writing your specs, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But you know, it helps you sometimes to understand where problems happen to be. Um, we can go and correlate this sort of thing to committer. Another thing, which I don't really have a slide for, which is rather powerful, is correlating um, if you have spec, if you look at commits that happen frequently together, and you have the ratio of spec commits to method commits, and you look at that and you kind of correlate it by different areas of your code base, you can identify areas where people are reluctant to go and write tests. And it may be that you have some controller, for instance, and chance, and when you look, look at the metrics of it, you determine that, well, you know, the specs don't get added all that often when people make production changes. And so you might go and say, well, why is that? And then go back and look at that particular control and understand why is it people aren't writing tests here? And you know, you may see what the answer is, you may not, by the way. But it's still the kind of analysis you can do getting into these things. Okay. This is lifelines from one particular controller class. Okay. These are commits over time, and uh, these particular methods as they uh, as they get um, changes in them. And we can see that there's one particular method that goes and drops down to zero. And somebody thought better of it and went and put it back in. Uh, this method here that's green on the top, I probably want to take a look at and sort of see what happened over time with it. Looks like people did some refactoring, but the refactoring ended up moving code to another place. Uh, so you can see that sort of thing quite often when you look at live lines. This is another class called post. Okay? And um, we can see the history over time, a lot of turbulence in the very beginning as this thing started going to accumulate commits. Um, when we're marching along here, it looks like this green, green method that we happen to have um, received a real big surge going forward at uh, late step, and that might be a worthwhile looking into. Um, one thing I've seen over time in code bases is that there are some code bases where people are very diligent about refactoring, and you'll see rhythm to things. You'll see that, well, add complexity removal, add complexity removal, add complexity removal. And then you'll see other areas of the code base where complexity keeps on adding and adding and adding and adding. And then you have a big you know, reduction at some point in time. And it's funny about that because you can go and say, well, you know, is that a better pattern or not? It turns out that some teams are actually very okay with going and adding complexity over time in an area and knowing that that's a problem area. And then they can go and get to the point where they say, okay, well, look, it's a better problem going forward. We just don't know how to refactor this yet. And then all of a sudden, bing, we understand how to refactor this, so we're going to go ahead and ramp it down and sort of like move things out into other areas. And that can be you know, rather useful to be able to recognize it as a coding stock within a code base. There are, of course, other code bases where you simply don't see the dip downs at all. And we know what that means. It's not that good. This is another thing we're looking at also. Ownership effect. Okay? Um, and I don't have an awful lot of data for this across many code bases. But what this is is basically the chances that somebody is going to um, refactor something based upon the number of commits that they have within it. Okay? Um, actually, let's make sure I'm saying that right. So go back to... Okay, so for particular... Yeah, no, actually, this is a different. For ownership effect, it's basically the chances that the number of people that have touched that particular method. Okay, you take the number of people that have touched that method and you correlate it against the size of the method. Okay, so in this case here, we basically have methods which, you know, this is a very small code base, but essentially it seems like you know at one and at two and at three, essentially um, we have had. You know, we've had some methods that have touched only by one person, by two people, by three people. And we have like this ramp down which occurs with this. And what that really kind of indicates is that essentially it seems like the methods which are higher in size, and that's what the y-axis is here, um, basically those are ones which haven't been touched by too many people. Okay? If you have methods which have been touched by many people, it tends to go sort of ramp down like this. 
I'll show you another code base in a little while which has the same type of thing. It seems that there's a thing that happens across code bases where either methods that are very long, people avoid them and do other work, okay? Or if they are very long, that means they just haven't had enough people working on them yet. So they'll start to do work, work and they'll break it down to small pieces. This is actually decent evidence if we can actually demonstrate, you know, prove it, um, that having multiple people working on a code base has a very strong beneficial effect for um, the system in terms of refactoring. Okay. And here's for that code base the average lines per commit by month. Okay, this is basically going to show you the history of the ads and deletes for this code base over time in order to sort of see, you know, um, are we adding code a lot at this particular point in time, are we deleting code a lot at this particular point in time. Um, this kind of thing is rather useful for tracking for a particular team. You know, get a sense of what the activity level has been like within the um, code base, how much it's growing. And so as you can correlate that back to other events that happen within the development team. Whoops. Okay. Another thing that I find kind of interesting, these are lifelines for specs in this particular project. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting with this, it seems like there definitely are different coding patterns for things that are specs as opposed to regular methods. You see a lot more stability in specs over time. There's hardly ever big leaps in complexity. It's pretty much exactly what you would uh, expect. But it's kind of funny when I'm going to do a diagram that shows both the specs and the methods, it's pretty easy quite often to see which ones are specs because they end up going in growing, becoming stable, and just sort of last forever. And that's just a typical lifeline behavior for specs. And this is the hour profile for NCAG. This is basically the um, number of commits, uh, number of method events that occur per minute of the hour over the entire history of the code base. And uh, there's a very big spike there at 36. That could mean that we just had one big massive commit that happened one time in the code base. We can check that out, or it could just mean that basically at that time, that's people are going to tend to have major commits for the uh, Mercury app is a Rails application created by um, Corey Haynes and his, um, his girlfriend, um, Corey and Sarah. And um, it's really a very good, well-structured application. It's, it's worthwhile taking a look at some of the things which come from it. Um, you can see here the unique committers we have in the code base are Sarah, Corey Haynes, Corey, Spencer, and Sarah. Do you think there's any duplication there? Yeah. Looks like they've had a couple of different aliases over time. Uh, but we can naturally munch those things together. 7,788 method events, okay? Those are the number of things that happened changing particular methods in the history of this code base. And um, we can see what the ratio is for each one of these people. Um, essentially, we can see that Corey Haynes, his uh, spec method ratio is about 0.5, Sarah's is about 0.4. Um, the one for Sarah, you know, we can kind of munch those together and see what it is totally. Um, knowing them pretty well, it seems like they basically go ahead and pair quite often more on her commit name than on his. This is a particular class within their code base, the user class. And um, they are really very diligent about refactoring. You can start to see this if you look at a variety of different um, uh, lifelines for particular classes. You see lots of spikes up and then immediate spikes down that happen over the course of the you know, life of a particular class. Um, this is an interesting case here. This is the feelings controller class. Uh, to kind of explain what Mercury app is, it's kind of like a, a nice application you can use to go ahead and keep track of, um, it will kind of remind you every day to go and put down a value. And on a scale of like one to five, you can basically go ahead and say how do you feel about something that's happening in your life that particular day. And you can track particular things like, oh, how do I feel about my diet? And it's just like every day you want to give it a value. And you can start to see these correlations with other life events that you have. Um, so it's kind of odd to have a class called Feelings Controller, but I assure you there's nothing to find. So, right? um, this particular class, so you can see over the lifeline what's happening with this particular thing. This, um, this method right here, the blue one, that kind of drops down to zero, is essentially a create method within the particular class. So it looks like it basically goes and gets complexity, it dips down, gets complexity, it dips down. And they finally said, that's enough of this, we're just not going to do anything else with it. And drop it down to zero and move things out to another area. Um, there's this other method here that's the register method that keeps on growing up and growing up and growing up over time. And uh, it looks like it needs a bit of work. Um, knowing them, I think this is probably one of those areas where they keep on adding complexity, but they're kind of like letting it gel until they get to the point where they can actually start to go decide how to refactor this into smaller pieces and big things. Yeah. Okay. This is um, that thing, ownership effect that I mentioned a little bit earlier for their code base. Okay. We can definitely see uh, that as a trend there. Essentially, that as more people go ahead and touch the um, 
particular methods, they tend to have less length. Okay? And uh, it's a little bit more pronounced in the effective side where you know the data is kind of small, so it's hard to really tell. Okay. Average lines of commit per commit by month. Okay, so that's trending history. We can go and see what's happening with that. And this is their hour profile. It's a little bit different. They have things that happen right around the 20th minute of every hour they tend to commit. Um, more complexity. And for them it's like more like 50 than about four years now. So anyway, walk you through some of these things. I don't know. It's, it's funny because some of this stuff might look and say, oh, well, it's boring. But the thing I'm hoping to go and get you guys into, at least with this, is recognize that we have a lot of interesting information available to us within our version control systems. And we can mine this and get useful information about what we're working on. Um, the thing about this, though, is that there are all sorts of issues that come up when you're trying to basically draw inferences from these things. One of them is really the commit problem. And it's basically true that for any development team and any particular set of workers, um, some people commit more frequently than others do. Right? Some people do very tight focused commits and they do them one after another. Um, others will hold on to their work for you know, maybe an hour, an hour or two before committing their work. And that does tend to skew the results a little bit. Okay? It's something you can detect that you can see what the commit history is for particular developers, particular areas of the code base, and sort of getting a sense of how people work in that particular area. But you can't draw strong inferences against that without taking into account the fact that people um, have different styles when they're doing their work. Another thing. Um, is really the social environment problem. If we were to try to go and sort of abstract away from all this and arrive at general truths of how people develop software, um, it really comes down to that style issue again. It's very possible for us to go and have teams that work equally well but have very different committing styles. And as a result, it's hard to take the data and kind of like um, munch against each other and sort of discover things about how uh, these people are working because of their commit styles being so different. Um, this one right here is one I worry about a lot. Okay? In fact, quite often when I make these diagrams, I try to I tend to obscure the committer information. Because you know, it's really a, an awkward thing to go and have something in an organization where it's like, okay, you know, there's Jeff over there. He isn't committing as much as Ryan. So what are we going to do about that? And Jeff, commit more. Right? And then we get to commit more, but maybe it doesn't really. Maybe they aren't addictive commits, you know, that kind of thing. You can try to go and sort of judge people based upon this kind of stuff. I don't think that's a great thing to do. I think in general, it's nice to be able to go and sort of keep information like this local. And um, if a team consists of a bunch of people that trust each other very well, they know how to handle it. Well. Um, if you tend to go take this information and broadcast it outside the team, you can end up producing secondary effects where people do things kind of odd in order to actually bump up their numbers. And, and uh, you know, I mean, there's it's a typical thing about like gaming the system. In essence. Uh, sometimes the uh, gaming that people do isn't really nefarious at all. It's just basically just recognizing I need to commit more and we're going to do these things. And it may not be the best, you know, best antidote for these things. In general, though, I think this kind of analysis is very handy for people who are working in a team locally and they want to find out more about how they work and have discussions about how to do things a bit differently. Um, it's also nice to go and take this information to particular areas of your code base as opposed to going and saying let's deploy it with committers. And um, you can discover a bit more about areas of code which may require more work, you know, um, patterns of commits across the day can tell you a bit about um, you know, what kind of trouble you may be having with your build system, things along those lines. Um, and it's kind of hard to arrive at general truths with this sort of thing, but it can be something that you sort of use internally for your own, your own diagnostic purposes. Um, yeah, dangerous knowledge is kind of like an extension of, uh, of blame, you know, that you can, uh, uh, I think, one thing that every team generally has to, you know, that uses say velocity, for instance, has to deal with this. Uh, somebody in another part of the organization is saying, how come your velocity is low? Increase it. Make it higher. That kind of thing, right? Um, the same type of thing can happen with complexity scores and various other things that you have within your code base that you broadcast into a wide organization. Uh, you need to have really the political power to withstand, you know, well-meaning scrutiny that might lead you to change your practices. Um, it's nice to be able to go and sort of say, yeah, okay, I understand that these methods are really high in complexity. And you can say, let's reduce all those things. But it's like, you can end up in that situation I talked about earlier, where you end up mutating the code in a very bad way in order to achieve a metric that ends up going and reducing the understandability of the entire code base. Okay? I'm hoping that as people do more and more of this, we'll start to get more of a sense of what the natural shape of the code base really is. And we can start to basically compare back and forth and go and sort of get a sense of 
you know, this is a healthy code base, that isn't a healthy code base, these are the indicators, that kind of thing. But uh, um, if you have very idealized visions, like all methods will be less than five lines, you know, that's sure recipe for disaster. Um, the story I like to tell in regards to this, have you ever seen coverage information misused in an organization? Only one person? Oh, that's pretty long. Two? Okay. Three? Yeah. Okay, Mary. <clears throat> yeah, it's a strange thing. I happened um, a couple years ago, I was over in Texas, and I saw some of the most atrocious unit tests I've ever seen in my life. And um, it was really kind of hard to even get a sense of exactly why this was happening. They just weren't written all that well. They weren't clear to understand the OMS lines. And it turns out that uh, about a year earlier, the um, development managers have basically said, look, we are going to start recording coverage for all our commits, um, and we're going to sort of flag things when they don't have enough coverage. And people have to go back and they have to test and basically get the coverage numbers out. Well meaning, well intentioned, right? And it ended up producing what I just mentioned. So it's kind of a funny thing. And the thing is, I don't think the developers even realized it. You know, I think they just ended up producing tests that were a little bit less clear because it's kind of like, well, this is just another thing I need to do. I need to get my coverage. And you can basically twiddle the test a little bit in order to actually get the coverage that you need. And twiddle, 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 and that's kind of like the other test. Well, it's not very clear. Um, these kinds of secondary effects in an organization are something that you have to be really, really careful about. And quite often, uh, you can see them coming, you know, in advance, and you kind of think through it. And you can say, look, you know, it's like it's nice when we get our coverage numbers up. We don't want to make that an explicit goal. If we do, we might end up going and producing secondary effects that aren't all that great in our companies. I think kind of awful. So generally speaking, I think metrics can be kind of useful as an informational thing. Um, a nice analogy I like to use for this sort of thing is uh, if you go to the hospital, right, and say uh, you see a friend who happens to be, you know, uh, have all the vital signs monitors and stuff like this, you might look at blood pressure. You might say, oh, blood pressure is doing this, 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 and this. That must mean this, right? Is that a valid deduction? Right. There's a reason why the monitor has many different measures, okay? And it's because no one particular measure is going to give you a complete picture of what's going on. Maybe that was pulse is going up, the blood pressure goes down, and this and this and this and this. That could indicate something. Okay. In much the same way, with metrics, it's nice to go and sort of get a sense that they really are vital signs for a project. And more than that, vital signs for a code base. I think kind of uh, a very useful thing to go and be aware of. So I'm tending to now, as I do this sort of thing with teams, just, you know, end up, uh, in the beginning, I was kind of hoping to go and sort of like find universal truths of development. It's kind of like things that tend to be true across all code bases. And it's, um, it's a bit of like a modernist street to want to go and do that sort of thing. Uh, but it just may be that, you know, this could be a way for people to go and sort of dig in deeper in uh, their code base and learn about things that they didn't really quite realize. And um, essentially, if you're on a team, you quite often have the context that you can use to interpret results that other people would not have because they haven't been part of the team for a period of time. They haven't seen the history of the code base. So it can be a very useful thing. So things to look for. Okay. Um, when I work teams and we do this sort of thing, it's nice to go and look at the relationship between the presence of tests and refactoring. Okay, just as a, it's almost like a propaganda tool in essence. It's kind of like if you can see refactoring, it's changes a method that reduce complexity, and you can see that these things really tend to happen far more often in areas that are covered by tests. It's very valuable. You know, it's, it's expected, and um, you know, it's really strong evidence that having test coverage would be very useful and basically give people a lot more liberty to refactor things, a lot more understanding. Of uh, benefit of having tests around things. Um, another thing to look at in the code base when you're doing this sort of thing is why high churn happens in particular classes and methods. Okay? And I was showing you that diagram earlier where everything kind of just went off to the top on the right hand side. Um, there's a reason for every one of those things. Right? Why do particular methods get hit all the time? Sometimes it is that case of having uh, code that's really being treated like data. Um, in other cases, it really is that rampant nested conditional stuff that you would want to go and sort of look at, try to isolate, try to refactor, and um, start to get, um, gain uh, benefits from. If I have any kind of a pipe dream at all for this sort of thing, I'd love to be able to go and sort of gather enough data to be able to go and tell early whether a method is prone to become <laughs> a runaway and end up going and taking on unnecessary complexity. Um, I think if we can learn to go and get you know, early indicators of when complexity is about to happen in the code base, it might change our development style a bit more. Um, Another thing that I think would be great to go and dig into is identification patterns for good programming episodes. Okay? 
Um, I've noticed that some teams I work with, they tend to have like a nice cadence to their commits, and it's kind of like they sort of, everything kind of, uh, kind of rolls out in a nice way. It's kind of like they, they do some work, they commit it, they do some refactoring, they commit it, you can see over the log of commits that this was really a nice cadence for the work. You know, there's other cases where you can sort of like look at something like, okay, this is like a, you know, a, a massive attack, we hit this, and then we just go out and move other things. And, and if you can basically detect these kinds of patterns in the code base, you might be able to go and get a sense of what the working style of the team happens to be and how the team might want to make some adjustments and you know, sort of move towards um, you know, particular programming episodes that are more strongly correlated with healthy code bases. Okay. As far as I know, nobody's looking for that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's definitely lots of things you can look at if you're going to try to apply this kind of analysis back if you were. How does commit frequency vary across the day? Uh, can you correlate commit frequency, frequency and complexity? Correlate time of day and complexity in your team? Can you correlate commit size and complexity? That's something we've looked at in the team. Right? So it's kind of interesting. The, um, it seems like there's this thing that happens in some teams where when there's very high complexity commits, it tends to be to a very small number of files. Okay? And as a result, people, you know, it seems like as you spread out and have more files you're making changes to at once, the complexity in each one of them doesn't tend to be quite as high. And I don't know whether that's really just a statistical effect or not. Um, so anyway, this is um, something I've been digging into for a while. And um, the last one I have here, there's basically a project that I have on GitHub called Repo Depot for Ruby. And it's um, essentially tools for doing this kind of analysis on Ruby code bases. There's another thing I showed a little bit earlier called Turbulence that I worked with um, Chad Bauer and Corey Haynes on. To go and just create those diagrams that so basically going to show you the um, uh, complexity versus commit graph for particular code bases. And that can be really a nice, useful way of going and starting to identify trouble points. Um, but yeah, it's an area I'm digging into and trying to go and find out a lot, a lot more about. Um, and like I said, I don't know that we're really going to arrive at general truths, but I think it is something that is yet another tool in the arsenal for us as um, developers doing our work. Uh, we can find out more about how we develop because we've got the data. And uh, why not? Here. So one thing I don't quite understand is how you get historical complexity. How do you get historical complexity? Yeah, because you obviously get the complexity of any file at every time. So yeah. is that like stored as a um, sort of picture of that file? Or computed as it's committed, or how do you do that? Yeah, well, essentially it's ripping through a repository and basically going and getting out each file at each commit, yeah. and going and getting a complexity score for that particular file and compare it against the next commit against that file. When is the complexity score computed? It's computed, it's computed for every commit. And I basically go ahead and I rip through a repository and just do it for each commit. I get, check out all those files, do the complexity score for it, move on to the next commit, check out all those files, and do that. Now the thing is, it's, it's also, it depends on which one of these analysis, analyses we're looking at. Um, there were a couple things I showed here that were file level complexity. Yeah. Okay. There's also method level complexity that I've been doing some work with also, which would be comparing the complexity of methods over time. You'd have to go and find out for any particular commit point what the complexity is, regardless of whether that particular method changed or not at that commit. That so, is, could you have a yeah. I haven't done that yet, but it's a natural place to go and take this sort of thing. It's just make it a um, uh, make it something which happens on every commit, you know, against your repository. It's something you're computing after the fact for every single thing. Right, but you could still do it incrementally by going ahead and sort of as the commit occurs, you basically get a complexity score for that, and you can tie it to the last commit and basically go get a sense of what the delta happens to be. So generally, the information is all there. It's just a matter of going and actually grabbing it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, nuggets of universal truths? Maybe like if you hear this law of effects and things we want to investigate, have you taken it further and come up with any pauses to really add drives? It's um. Well, I guess the main ones really are that thing. It seems to be true that the amount of complexity added per commit has a slight rise over time for a history of repository. I've seen that a number of times. Um, the, 
runaways that you see in the upper right-hand quadrant of complexity versus commits, um, they tend to quite often become, they tend to very often be those nested conditional methods. So we, we already need to avoid those things, right? But it's the thing that's really kind of interesting about that, at least it points out to me that that's basically that is a trajectory. They tend to get more complex over time unless you start to get them early. Um, in terms of other universals, um, not really. I, there is this thing that seems like you have higher levels of complexity committed earlier in the day for teams that are, earlier in the afternoon for teams that are doing well, and late in the afternoon for teams that are doing poorly. But I can't say that definitively. I think it would require more analysis and some more code bases. Definitely want to do the incremental thing, though, because it's like I'm working with code base right now, and it takes about 20 hours to go and rip it <laughs> and to gather up all the data that I need in order to go and do things. Um, and that's starting from zero for a very large numbers. Yeah? Would you expect uh, those charts to be changed uh, depending on source control system? I'm talking about distributed versus traditional source control. Yeah, and it, it's a funny thing. It's, you have to be careful about what kind of analysis you're applying. So I've been doing all this with Git. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like there are some tools you can use to get information directly from Git and Ruby. But generally what I've been doing is parsing against Git logs. Um, there's a nice um, feature of Git log called top of sort that basically goes ahead and gives you it commits in topological order. So that in essence, if you have something you worked on a branch by itself, it'll go and group all those commits together in a sequence of time and inject them right at the point where that's committed against the main repository. Okay, so generally speaking, if you have a distributed repository, you've got to go and take one particular version naturally and assume that that's your, your thing. And then basically if you are getting history in from other um, from other work, um, is you've got to make sure that it doesn't get interleaved in the history. And that's something, something you can see as distinct episodes. Um, so that's kind of tough. Um, done this with subversion a little bit, and that tends to be a little bit easier. The thing about Git that is really kind of awkward is people going into rebases inside of your repository, because then you lose some history. And then that's okay. So basically, when you're talking about commits, is it local commits or it's commits to the central repository? It's commits to the central repository, but any commits that are done locally are folded in. If you so want basically, to people can have tendency to batch commits. Sorry? Uh, people have tendency to have many commits to local and then batch, uh, batch all of them and come into. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. If, if that's part of the working style, then that ends up being you lose information. And that's the thing that's kind of sucky with this in a way is that essentially we never really, we never really control over that sort of thing. So it's hard to like, basically get at general truths. Every team does things a little differently. You know, different individuals do things differently. So you don't really have, you know, like a, a great. Picture of like what one developer's you know history and the way the code things happens to um, What I think would be kind of neat is actually going to set things up so that you're surreptitiously going and getting snapshots of code you know all the time. Okay, and then you're able to say look once every once every five minutes you get a snapshot that's there. But that's a rather deep tool issue to be able to actually get that kind of information. And you have to go and decide whether it's really what you want to see work that hasn't been committed yet, work that's still in the editor. I mean. And so it almost gets overwhelming also. You don't really buy it, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. How would you measure productivity and would you want to? How would you measure productivity and would you want to? There's a great blog by um, Martin Fowler about. Sorry, using, using version. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. But basically, he points out how hard it is to measure productivity in general. You know, you, it's really hard because you have to get down to really what the value of a particular work happens to be. And so as a result, it's really kind of hard to measure that at all. Um, you can have somebody in your organization that writes five lines of code a day that are way more productive and useful than you would have, you know, commit lots and lots of things. Um, in terms of this, I mean, one thing that um, I think is uh, valuable, I've seen in some organizations, is paying attention to churn, okay? And it's not really to see productivity as much as you want to find out when people are blocked, okay? If you um, see people who are basically adding the leading lines that are relatively steady pace, it seems like they're able to get work done. If they aren't able to do that, it could be blocked by something else. But uh, in terms of actual how that measures into productivity, I think that's just a, you know, it's a general thing that people would love to have and we only have. Um, one thing I'll mention before going on from that, uh, Joshua Karyevsky is the head of industrial logic. And one of the things that he's been talking about quite a bit recently is um, trying to go and sort of get for particular features that you have a sense of how much money is earned by that particular feature. And try to tie that back down to the work that happens in the code base. Um, sounds like an interesting way of approaching things. I don't know if I have already stopped. There's another question? Yeah. Uh, 
have you done any comparison between the, uh, the Azure project versus the more traditional project? No, I don't have data for that, unfortunately. It would be interesting because uh, Agile, you only do a design as needed, like right, suppose. And the more traditional one, you would have done lots of design up front. So it would be interesting to see what the Yeah, no, it would be. It would be. The impact. I think so, some of this stuff, um, the thing that I think is kind of funny is that it seems like nobody's really touching this area yet, right? Um, there's a lot of work that's been done to go and say, look, let's take a snapshot of the system and sort of like go and calculate the complexity and method size and class size and stuff like that. And I think there's been comparisons done between Agile and non-Agile projects and stuff on those lines. But the thing that's interesting to me about this sort of thing is basically going and seeing what happens over time in a code base. Um, I'd love to actually do that, take something which is a bit more, uh, you know, um, a bit more of a water, water style, uh, waterfall style development, and try to go and basically draw some differences between that and uh, something that's more agile. The thing also though is you get into the commit problem rather severely. Uh, you know, just the frequency of commits might be wildly different between those two types of projects. So, yeah. Michael, have you analyzed the uh, the group on code base? Yeah. Any, any observations you can share? You can't. I don't think I can say anything. <laughs> no, it's funny. I, I haven't really had any discussion with anybody in the organization about what I can and can't say about the code base. But it is a very large Rails application. And it's something which has grown uh, very quickly over the course of three years. Um, lots of interesting things in it. Um, but yeah, I am doing some analysis and trying to get that information back to uh, various teams to you know, basically help us make some strategic decisions about things. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, for me, it's, relative, it's only in this past year I've really dealt with Rails projects, so it's really hard to really get a sense of what the good patterns are for various things and as far as like going and measuring things as they change over time. Um, I'm hoping you want to get more data about that sort of thing. Uh, Corey Haynes in particular has been doing some very cool work with going and uh, writing fast specs that run you know, miraculously fast in, uh, um, in the system. And one thing I've been able to do is sort of like look at ratios of code complexity and models and controllers and helpers. And, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to go and look at that immediately from a metrics point of view and say, look, we can make some recommendations here. It's, it's kind of nice. Yeah? Uh, with this, would you be able to correlate the um, complexity added with uh, uh, per branch or like see how different branching strategies might uh, affect the complexity? Or, uh, I haven't done that yet. But I think it'd be an interesting thing to, to look at. Uh, there's a guy who's an apprentice uh, where I work now. He's looking at whether um, uh, how merges affect, merges from different people affect code. And uh, that's, that's a neat area to look at. The thing is that this is a very wide open area. If anybody who wants to get into it, by all means, should dig into it. I think we've discovered an awful lot. And it's, it's weird that there is that dichotomy between, you know, it's like what we could determine is kind of like global true and um, what might make sense to uh, observe on a particular team. Uh, but no, I haven't really gotten in that area at all. Any questions? So I have all this stuff in Ruby. And there's one guy who forked off turbulence, and he used a tool for Java to go and get at the um, uh, method level um, complexity figures and stuff on those guys. Um, I just want to go and kind of open up and say, hey, you know, anybody who wants to go and sort of do this in another language, it's, it's really a nice thing you can start digging into. Um, imagine being able to go and just ask some of these questions in code. And ask what's happened over time in a particular project. And uh, uh, you just don't know what you're going to find. But I think you find some very interesting things. So. Okay, thanks.